Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. My name's Sally Warhaft, and it is a great pleasure to be the host for this evening's event, a slightly different um, kind of event for uh, our Fifth Estate series. Tonight, of course, we're bringing you a very special lineup, our candidates for Lord Mayor. And we have eight of the nine. We did have all nine, but um, sadly, Burhan Ahmed had to pull out at the last minute. So we're thrilled, though, to have um, the other eight with us tonight. And it's your opportunity to see them all together, to hear their ideas, and to ask them questions. The format is going to be quite strict, obviously, with um, eight speakers. So each of our candidates are going to get three minutes right at the start uh, to introduce themselves um, and to say whatever they want to say about what is important and distinctive about their bid. And um, if you don't think three minutes is a long time, the Gettysburg Address was just over two minutes. and. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, of course, described the principles of human equality and democracy. He memorialised the dead. He said the words government of the people, by the people, for the people. He had smallpox and did it from a cemetery. So I have high expectations because we've given them an extra minute. They will be timed. They will hear that after two and a half minutes. And after three minutes, they will be unelectable. It will be pretty strictly followed. Um, after their addresses, I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions of them just to get things going, and then I'll throw it over to you. They will be speaking in alphabetical order, and I'm not going to waste time by getting up and introducing them between speakers. They can introduce themselves with those spare seconds we so thoughtfully gave them. So, uh, But I will welcome first Robert Doyle in alphabetical order. Thank you, Sally. And uh, uh, my fellow candidates for Lord Mayor, first could I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we are gathered tonight, the members of the great Kulin Nation, and pay my dear personal respects to their elders past and present, and thank their elders, particularly those of the Wurundjeri, whose lands these are, for the work that they do throughout our community as, as we gather here tonight. Sally, could I also point out that the Gettysburg Address did follow a previous main speaker of three hours. So uh, I, I would keep it short too, if, if I were Lincoln, and he did so extremely well. Look, first of all, I've considered it a be great honour to be our Lord Mayor for the last four years, and I'm asking you to consider me to be the Lord Mayor to do some unfinished business. First of all, I'm very proud that we run the city as a business, because unless you have a AAA credit rating, unless you keep rates low, unless you actually build up surpluses, unless you reinvest in record amounts of capital investment, then you can't do the other things that we want to do, like caring for the vulnerable, like building our streets, like caring for our parks and gardens, like providing childcare and libraries, all those things we want to do. First of all, the economic record stands, and I'm very proud of what we have done over the last four years in all of those things I mentioned in the first part of this speech. Secondly, I would say I've tried to identify three of the themes that I think are important for the next four years, and I'll briefly give you those three and an example or two of each that I want to take forward. The first is safety in our city, and it's particularly important. I'm an unashamed supporter of CCTV cameras. I would extend that reach into the city. I would take it to places like North Melbourne, like at Melrose and Canning, or on the bridge between Southern Cross Station and Etihad. I would point out that the audit of the safe city cameras released just a week ago shows that there were 1,330 instances of of spot arrests that were either captured by cameras, where cameras were a part of it, or we dispatched police to it. I would also point out that in the Richmond public housing flats where the government installed CCTV cameras, crime there, police tell me, has dropped by 20% in the last year as a result of those cameras being there. They work, they're important, they're an important part of safety. The second part of our city is livability. And you've got to keep on working at that. I'm very proud that we're the world's most livable city for the second year in a row. But just today, for instance, I announced an initiative where I went with George Colin Burroughs, one of our great chefs, down to what's been a bomb site in our city for 20 years at 567 Collins Street. And you may know it, just down below King Street. And the owners there, APN, have given us permission to do a pop-up park there, 
to have George Colin Burris and other chefs of the city and other urban farmers create a market garden of vegetables. We can put a walkway down from Collins Street and what has been a bomb site and an eyesore can become an oasis in the centre of the city. And that's the sort of initiative I want to pursue. And finally, the biggest challenge facing us, and that is planning for the growth of the city. I'm very proud of the hard work we've done over three and a half years to produce the Municipal Strategic Statement, which talks about which areas of our city are stable, which areas of our city are undergoing change, and where development is possible. And at a micro level, at a meeting just a couple of weeks ago, we protected Kensington and a house in Kensington because that's a stable area. But we're also able to have major economic development in our city in appropriate areas. And that's the important part about development, in appropriate areas. And finally, as an example of planning for growth, I was critical of Docklands, $300 million worth of community plan for community infrastructure sorely needed. That's planning for growth. Hi ladies and gentlemen, it's an honour to be standing for the third time for the City of Melbourne. I only asked for one thing. I asked for the Lord Mayor, a new Lord Mayor of Melbourne, because I believe it's time for change. Our, our policy is cut out council waste and therefore cut rates, cut out rorts, cut out cronyism. We want a council that's transparent and is fully disclosed everything. If you read the newspapers in the last few days, you would be horrified at what the age has suggested with regard to Robert Doyle and his team. The police should be investigating the matter. If they're not in, and if it's not true, Robert Doyle should be suing them. I believe that this is a turning point in Melbourne City Council. In 1998, I gave a paper, now there's no corruption in Indonesia, Australia must be next. Nothing's changed. We've had a circus in Canberra in the last week. We've had the front pages of the papers talking about rorts and, and despicable things happening, both in sport and business. And I want to change Melbourne for the good. I want heritage respected. We don't want concocted reports put into the VCAT like I experienced with the MCG Hotel, the home of football. We don't want the Windsor Hotel report going to the Heritage Council, which doesn't take into account all the issues. There are too many matters decided in confidential se sessions behind closed doors. Cronyism dictates the appointment of City Council boards. The board of Citywide was not correctly, uh, was not transparent. We don't want ex-politicians giving seats on boards without going through the correct, correct process. Both Brumby and Birrell were recently appointed to the citywide boards. We're going to in introduce attendance voting and remove electoral warts. We're going to make recruitment and appointments, as I said, open, and we're going to record all council sessions. The only reason to vote for me is to make Melbourne a better place and make it honest. It's serious. A lot has changed since my wife's great-great-grandfather, Henry Condor, was the first mayor of Melbourne. We're a massive city, we're a worldwide city, and we must have transparency. We must have honesty. We, the electors must know what's going on. What I said in 1998 has to change. 30, 14 years ago, nothing's changed. We've got corruption everywhere. We've got it in the federal government, we've got it in the state government, we've got it in local government, we've got it in sporting bodies, that's the only reason to vote for me. If you want it to keep going the way it's going, don't vote for me. I didn't put Robert Doyle last for, for any other reason that he's had four years as Lord Mayor. We don't want more of the same. We want change. And that's the reason I'm standing. I have nothing else to gain except to make a better Melbourne. And everyone in this room and everyone watching this broadcast should believe in what I say. I didn't preference the Greens. I preferenced seven other candidates before Robert Doyle. So every other candidate I put before Doyle because I think that's what Melbourne needs. One of us to win. Thank you.
Can I just remind the candidates to introduce themselves? That was Gary Morgan, for those of you that didn't know. Well, I better get it right. I'm, <clears throat> I'm David Nolte. I'm the Lord Mayoral candidate for the Our Melbourne team. I also would like to acknowledge the, the elders of the Wurundjeri tribe, of the Coulomb Nation, who were the, the original inhabitants on the land where we are now. We have entered this campaign in the most open, transparent and honest manner we can. So let me make a pledge. We will ban developers making donations to the Melbourne City Council campaigns. We will cap candidate spending and we will end secret council meetings. And we will not allow a cult of secrecy to continue in the council. We will root it out. We have published the full donations of our campaign and so have most other candidates. It's disappointing that the Team Doyle will not do the same. We believe our policies are the most thorough, realistic and achievable of all on offer. And I suggest you go to www.ourmelbourne2012.com.au and you'll see what I'm talking about. We believe the Melbourne City Council is totally out of touch with residents and small business. I'll repeat, residents and small business, the small end of town. So what thorough, realistic and achievable policies have we got to bring the council back to the community? We will open neighbourhood offices in all our city precincts. These offices will become the local face of the council in the community. They will be bureaucracy busters for small business, residents and community groups. They will offer advice and provide direct assistance to these people and groups. We will improve safety in Melbourne with our plan to run two extra train services out of the CBD at 2am and 3am on Friday and Saturday nights. I repeat that because it's simple but it's important. Two late night extra trains from the CBD, 2am and 3am Fridays and Saturdays. We will provide independent environment impact statements on the East West Link for each impacted state precinct. These statements will provide full information of the effects of traffic flow, heritage and all areas of potential environmental stress. We will generate a pro-employment environment among the small business in the city. We have developed comprehensive policies for the City of Melbourne and before you vote, I urge you, as I said before, to visit our website, ourmelbourne2012.com.au to, to read what we've put a lot of time into. I thank you. Hi, I'm Alison Parks. I'm the Greens candidate for Lord Mayor, but you probably already guessed that because I'm also the only woman running in this candidacy. <laughs> I live and work in the city of Melbourne and I've been active in the community for many years. I'm a tenured academic at the University of Melbourne and I hold a business related PhD from that university, which I completed in 2008. I've built my career around best practice in financial management and I've held senior leadership positions in both the private and public sector including leading multi-million dollar financial systems projects. My current consulting work includes work with the Iraq Ministry of Finance to improve their data quality and financial transparency. As a full-time Lord Mayor, I will use these skills and experience to ensure that every ratepayer's dollar is spent as effectively as possible. I'm delighted to have David Collis running with me as Deputy Lord Mayor. David's an experienced educator. He teaches maths to Indigenous and international students through Trinity College. David's got a lengthy track record of con contributions to social justice initiatives and he lives locally in Carlton. 
We look forward to building on the achievements of Greens councillor Dr Cathy Oak. Cathy is an environmental consultant whose achievements as one Green voice on council include gaining record investments in large-scale sustainable infrastructure projects. Cathy also established the award-winning Melbourne Music Week. Cathy is our lead councillor candidate and we hope to see her continuing her work on council. She lives locally in North Melbourne. In preparing this speech, I was asked to comment on our vision for Melbourne and what differentiates us from other teams. The Greens team is different for a number of reasons. Firstly, all our candidates live in the city of Melbourne and most of us also work there. We know our city is a lived experience, not as somebody who leaves it every evening to go home somewhere else. Secondly, the Greens have created a comprehensive policy platform presenting over 100 initiatives. These policy initiatives are a result of extensive consultation with Greens members and Melbourne's residents and business communities. Thirdly, given our fully disclosed and minuscule campaign budget, Greens candidates do all their own work. This means that what you're seeing is authentic and not a facade that's been created by expensive spin doctors. I write my own speeches, I answer my own phone, and I personally and directly respond to queries from media and from ratepayers. Local connectedness and understanding, extensive community consultation, and transparency and directness will characterise the conduct of any Greens that you see fit to elect to Melbourne City Council. Moving on to our vision for Melbourne, the Greens' top priority is to effectively manage the rapid growth we're currently experiencing. The Greens will work to preserve the character and amenity of our city and make sure it remains a vibrant and prosperous place to live and work. We will ensure that services delivered to ratepayers meet their needs and that Council's decisions are based on long-term goals so the needs of future residents and businesses are not overlooked. Thank you for your time. Good evening, my name's Keith Rankin. I'm a resident at Docklands and uh, I too am standing for the position of Lord Mayor. One might ask oneself, why does anyone stand for that position? It involves countless hours of work, meetings, sometimes attending late into the night, even social functions that you really don't want to be at, one might think. But the real issues are what do we as candidates want to do for the city? Why is it that we want to serve the city? We see things that may be okay, but could be better. We see things that may be wrong and should be affected. The trouble we have at the moment is, I believe, decision making. How on earth do some of the decisions get made? And bear in mind that when you follow the path, a lot of decisions made by council are in fact directed by the senior management in the council. That means they prepare a draft report, they prepare a final report, they make a submission with a, a suggestion, and very, very few people read the content of the report. Very few people actually ask the questions, why are we doing this? An unfortunate lady gets run over because her bike tire is caught in a tram track and she's killed by a bus. No fault whatever is blamed on the bus driver or the bus. But the buses are moved out of Swanston Street to a point where their turnover drops to 48% of what it was beforehand. These are business people, employers, and also they're an attraction in the city. Somebody doesn't like horses because they make a smell when the bags are filled at the back. So we move them down to the shrine. Again, our tourists suffer, our tourist experience is diminished, and we have businesses going out of out of business because they can't afford to run in that way. Why would we make these decisions? We cancel the, the fireworks at nine o'clock in Docklands because an expert says that it's too hard to get families out of Docklands after 9.30 and revelers in. So we do away with families, we send them somewhere else, and we bring the revellers in to cause the problems, if they so, do so. I will just say, though, that the management of the uh, revelry for the last uh, 10 years has been exemplary and people behave beautifully. But what we have here is not a real problem. We have someone who doesn't want to solve the problem of having people leaving and entering at the same time. Far easier to just cancel a totally successful uh, initiative that was an initiative of the councils, I admit, but cancel it to the detriment of an area like Docklands. Yes, 
There will be uh, assistance put in place in the future to counteract that, we believe. But how was the decision arrived at? It was arrived at because somebody was too scared to manage the problem. We need to make decisions openly at the right time so everyone can work with it and we need everyone affected in the room at the time. That's my platform and I thank you for your time tonight. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here to have the opportunity to put before you some of the thoughts of the team that I represent for the City of Melbourne elections. My name is Brian Shanahan. I've been a councillor since 2004 and since that time have been chair of the Finance Committee of the City Council. I would begin, I think, appropriately by recognising that we stand here on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. But I also think it appropriate to pay my respects to the people who have built Melbourne in the last 180 years, turned a village into a magnificent city. And in paying that respect, I think we should also recognise the contribution that councillors of the City of Melbourne have made over those years. So I add that I pay my respects to councillors past and present. I'm passionate, as is my team, about the City of Melbourne. But we are also passionate that we approach things in a moderate, sensible, reasonable way. Let us first look at the city. The city is doing well. It could, of course, be better. I would advocate vote for us and it will be better. But let us first recognise that the city has a very good credit rating and has had it uh, under both the Lord Mayor, current Lord Mayor Robert Doyle and under the previous Lord Mayor John So. A very sound credit rating, in fact, a better credit rating than the state government. This is a tremendous basis on which we can build something. Our team is passionate that we build, that we don't engage in any destructive behaviour, but we build on the strengths we have. I will not go into the details of policy because we have so many and a number of them we actually agree, the teams actually agree, but I will highlight a few policies I think that may distinguish us and may indeed interest you and encourage your support for our team. The first one is uh, to support retail in a very significant, immediate and practical way. We propose setting up a $2 million fighting fund for retail. Now anecdotally, and I think from uh, some evidence, we can see that the retail sector is struggling a bit from a number of fronts. First of all, people are uh, buying online, uh, we're having trouble with access in and out of the city. We need to turn that around and the best people to advise us on how to turn it around is not me or the bureaucrats, but it is indeed the people that run our major retail areas. So we propose setting up a group of those people to advise us and have a two million fighting fund to work with. The other major policy area is safety. Everybody, of course, is in favour of safety. But let's look at a practical approach. And our practical approach is to put cops on the beat, more police on the beat. Cameras are great. They catch villains after they've done something. They don't necessarily stop anything. We need more police on the beat. And we can contribute to the funding of that. They're two significant issues. And I think that's about it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, thank you everyone for coming to it this evening to listen to us all. My name is Gary Singer and I'm standing for Lord Mayor with John So as my deputy. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and I want to talk to you uh, firstly a bit about my, the team I have put together to run for the city. Our team is made up, ha, is made up of experience, youth, passion and diversity. 
What we have in common is a desire to make our city better. We all love Melbourne. We want, we want to work with the community and improve what it is a wonderful home to us, a home to us all and a great place for us all to do business. Our team will focus when making decisions on three different things, the short term, the medium term and the long term. Because as a council, you have responsibility as to what this city will look like, not only in the next five years, but next 20 years, but the next 100 years. And you've, you must always take into account the repercussions of any decision you, you make on the future. We will keep party politics out of town hall. Both John and I are not a member of any political party, and we do not believe that party politics has a place to pay, play in local government. Over the last few weeks, we've been out in the streets talking to people all the time. And one of the two major issues that seem to come up are small business is doing it very tough in the city, and safety is of major concern to both business and residents. What we have done is develop a large number of policies which are available on our website, and I'm going to go through a, a few of these with you this evening. Now, the first one is that we will have no rate increase in 2014, and thereafter we will keep rates at below CPI increases. How will we do this? There is, we will do this by keeping a close eye on the bottom line. Being small businessmen, we understand that it's very easy for you to, for governments to raise, raise taxes to cover expenses, but what you've got to do is always look at the bottom line. We do it in our homes, we do it in our businesses, and this is really important to the future of the city. One of the other issues, one of our other policies is to institute 20 hour, 24 hour tram and train services on the weekend, from Friday through to Sunday. We have to be realistic about this. People do come into the city, they do get, they do have party on, they revel on, but one of the problems at the moment is they cannot get out of the city after 12.30, 1 o'clock. Public transport stops. What we need to do is move them out of the city. We will also have a free Swanson Street tram up and down the spine. We will advocate for greater police presence. We'll have a free Wi-Fi up and system up and down the, the uh, tram line, up, up and down the centre of the city. And we will install up to 500 affordable short-term parking spaces in the city, which will match with metre parking. So if you come into the city, you can park for two to three hours, do your business and leave. There are more policies and they are on our website. Thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> My name is Joseph Toscano. I'm standing with Dr G Neely on the uh, Put Public First mayoral ticket, or I should say citizen mayoral ticket. Look, my motto in life is be a realistic, demand the impossible. Every major social reform that we take for granted today was actually initiated by visionaries and activists who raised ideas which in their particular period were seen as way out there. Now, you've heard about the business sector, but has anybody talked about the people of the city of Melbourne, those who live and work here? Cities, cities are the engine room of civilisation. The people who live and work in cities stoke that boiler to keep that city going and make a city great. What makes a city great is not whether it's livable or not, but it's the, the people themselves and how they interact, how they work. Now, we are standing to defend, promote and extend public housing and public schools in the city of Melbourne. We are standing to increase rates, to actually double rates on properties over $10 million to quarantine that funding to tackle the perennial problems of homelessness and hunger you may have heard about that is occurring in the city of Melbourne, which has one of the highest concentration of public tenants in this country. We are standing to encourage council to divert 10% of the city's revenue 
towards setting up collectives and cooperatives to provide secure, stable in employment for the citizens of this city who can then can provide services and goods to the people of this city and the people outside the boundaries of the city of Melbourne. I mean, when we talk about employment today, we talk about working for somebody else or working for yourself. There are other mechanisms and we need a mechanism by which to provide that seeding funding. And if you look at cities across this, the world, many of the major cities are embarking on this idea to provide mechanisms by which their people can work. We are standing to ensure that a significant monument is erected opposite the city baths to Tanaminua and Moorboyhina. Two Indigenous freedom fighters were executed on that spot on the 20th of January 1842. So why are we waiting so long? Because if you go around the city of Melbourne, you would be forgiven for not knowing that this city has a black history. And to have a significant monument there would be a great rally in place. We are standing to change the name of City Square to Human Rights Square, because on the 21st of October, a few days' time, in five days' time, marks the, 21, marks the first anniversary when peaceful Occupy Melbourne protesters were removed in such a way which is a disgrace as far as the city is concerned. So be realistic, demand the impossible, vote one, put public first. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Um, there are so many things I found interesting about those presentations. Uh, and some of it is what wasn't mentioned. I find it curious um, that not one of you mentioned parks or bikes. And the reason, of course, is that you're all presumably for parks and bikes. Is that right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's interesting to me because, uh, you know, even just a few years ago, I think, uh, I mean, perhaps even Robert Doyle, you might uh, remember in the previous campaign, was that actually an issue that you would have talked about? Pick up a microphone. I'm not sure what your question is. Uh, did you talk about parks and, and bicycle tracks uh, as campaign issues last time? Last no, but I'm time standing around. this time. And, and what I've done, I'm very happy to stand on my record. I'm very happy with what we've done with Swanson Street. I'm very happy with the decision on Latrobe. I'm very happy to have spent $7.7 .7 million in the middle of the drought to actually make sure that our trees... Yeah, no, that's not what I'm asking very, you. I, I know, but this is what I'm, yeah. I'm answering you. Okay. <laughs> and it's answer time now, if I may say. And I'm very proud of the work that this whole council did on urban forests. So if you think it's important, so do I. And I want to continue that work. Okay, I'm going to ask, uh, who else ran last time? Anyone? Okay, can I ask you, Gary, was this an issue last time? What I'm trying to get a sense of is how the issues in this district have changed um, uh, over the, the current election. Yes, Sally. Uh, bikes clearly were an issue in the last election because it was very close to the, that unfortunate incident where that young lady was killed on Swanson Street. And yes, it, 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 it did play a part. Uh, parks also played a part because we were coming, we were still in that drought and it was of grave concern to the community, mm. both those issues. I, I just find it interesting that it's not something that in, when you have eight candidates here that one of them, even a Greens member, um, would feel the need to mention. Nobody mentioned population size either, Big Melbourne specifically. Yes, we did. Oh, okay. I, th I think I, we only had three okay, minutes, sorry. Sally. Yeah, no, oh, it, it, as a, well, as a big Melbourne or a small Melbourne, what size of a Melbourne uh, you would like? Okay, we might start with you, Alison. I might get a, a, a short response from each of you on this one. Okay, from an environmental perspective, it makes much better sense to have a city that has medium and high density at its core rather than sprawling out forever. Thanks. <clears throat> I think uh, a blend of Melbourne, we have, you respect the heritage and you also have new intensive development, but you also have, you have um, not open slather. We wanted more prosperous Melbourne. And a more prosperous Melbourne comes with more business, not run by government, but run by the private sector. So we want Melbourne to grow, but we want Melbourne to grow in a manner which allows us to have more parks, more recreation areas, and more um, 
sporting activity areas, and that can only happen if we're prosperous. So that's why I say it is a prosperous Melbourne that we're looking for, and that will allow us to have a bigger Melbourne because more companies want to come here from overseas and around Australia. This is exactly what I talked about with my third point about planning for growth. Okay, well, and, and in expand fact, on the whole, how, the whole how point, much growth. The, the whole point is you, have to, you can't talk in generalities. You actually have to do the hard work which we did over three and a half years to do the municipal strategic statement which actually says here are the areas which are stable, here are the areas which are ripe for development, here are the areas where development at this pace is about right. That document is now complete. It is a template for all Victoria. It's an enormous amount of hard work. And the example I gave was, at one end, it allows developments of quite large developments for prosperity, as, as Gary has pointed out. But it also, in our last planning meeting, protected a backyard in Kensington. There is no replacement for that specific hard work around how our city should look to bring certainty to investment but also certainty to neighbourhoods. That was the whole point of the third point I made around planning for growth. Joseph, would you like to go next? Look, whether we like it or not, Melbourne is going to grow. The history of Melbourne since the gold rushes has been a history of growth. What's important is, as uh, the Mayor just said, is what plans are put in place to regulate that growth to ensure that this continues to be a livable city. That is the key and the dilemma with the council is most of the power lies in the hands of the state government. Councils have been stripped of their power in, in this state since the uh, Kennett era and uh, unfortunately council is limited in what it can do because of this because councils are a creature of state government. They have no constitutional protection. Okay. Um, there is inevitable growth in our city and our city will get, will get bigger. It's how we manage it and how we cope with the growth. There is, it is important that growth goes along corridors and in the centre of the, the city because we, we are having a growing population and it will continue to grow uh, throughout this century. Uh, look, essentially I agree with the comments um, by um, Gary. Uh, Melbourne is growing. Um, we have limited power. Um, we put in place some very good plans and the State Minister, be it Labor or Liberal, tends to ignore them and go ahead with uh, his own whim or his own view. Uh, we need to plan, and we have plans in place, we need to be more careful about them, but we're looking at a population growth that's going to be quite large. Projections are that probably a 50% increase in our population in the next 20 years. So it's desperate that we have more power to plan properly. We should be advocating strongly with the state government to give us some more power, and we should be using that power to ensure that the growth is orderly and makes Melbourne even better as a livable city. Financially, we need the people. Uh, so it is a positive thing, but we need to make sure that uh, the growth doesn't get out of control. Thank you. Uh, financially, I'm not sure we do need the people in that uh, populist economies grow by deeming the population to increase and not giving two hoots about the quality of the life of the population and how much each person earns. Now, I've stated before the economic engine for society is GDP and people prefer to have 30 people earning $100 a year each than 15 people earning $150 a year each. I'd rather the 15. The quality of life is much more important. However, as soon as you make a city, a state, an environment a good place to live, people will want to live there. And that's part of the problem we have. Melbourne is so livable. Having said that, with the growth, we have to recognise and be realists. It will take place and we do need to take care as we go along of the population that moves in. Not just make ourselves so desirable that we are priced out of the reach of everyday Australians. We need to make sure that there is housing for every facet of our society and that every level can be catered to. But not just housing, of course, every other benefit that we provide in this city. Um, if you would like to ask a question, just put your hand up and somebody will come to you with a microphone. 
Um, and just say if it's obviously addressed to somebody specific or if it's a general question. My name is Paul Prentice. My first comment would be it is distressing to see the complete fatalism of practically all the candidates on the subject of population. Increase is not inevitable and the reason behind it is the federal government its policies are the ones that are driving population and the states and the councils can't do much about okay, it. Okay, do you have a question? Oh yes, yeah. uh, do I have a question? My council is not uh, Melbourne but Yarra. On the other hand, I'm on the committee of the Royal Park Protection Group and both these bodies are very concerned about the road tunnel and we would like to know, are there any of the candidates who are in favour of it? Uh, perhaps uh, those who favour the road tunnel could just put which, up there. Which tunnel? The road tunnel. There's many tunnels. The eastern, eastern freeway to... to uh, the east-west link? Freeway. Yes, the east-west link. Uh, could I ha have a show of hands of those who are in favour of the east-west link? Mr Morgan, thank you Okay, well, a show of hands first. East I don't West... think we do shows of hands, do we? I mean, well, we're... there are eight of you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to say, look, we are Actually, doing... no, excuse me, I'd like a show of hands. That's what the gentleman asked. He's come here to see you. Who is in favour of the East-West link? Hands up. Thank you very much. It wasn't that difficult. Now, Robert, if well, you'd like to go next was a question, tonight... Except that it was a question in a vacuum, because we don't know... Um, whether it will go ahead or not. We don't know whether it's financially viable. We don't know uh, what route it would take. We haven't had any of those debates. So it was a fairly facile exercise, to be honest. But the point I would still well, make this... is, the point I would still make is, if, it, if we are to deal with congestion, one of the big problems we have is that half of the cars in the city, and no city is trying to bring more cars into the centre. That's not what we want. But half of the cars in the city at any one point are not in the city for any purpose than travelling through it. So we've got to look at ways of moving cars out of the centre of the city and, if possible, stopping people from using their cars coming into the city, whether that's public transport or cycling or walking or whatever. But it's not as simple as just saying the east-west tunnel, yes or no. Remember a couple of weeks or a week and a half ago when the two tunnels under the Yarra were closed and the entire city went into lockdown. That same argument was used when those two tunnels were being built. We don't need it, there are other solutions. Okay, I might wrap it up. David, would you like to have a... Uh, raising your no, hand. no, wait, I'm gonna give one or two others a chance to respond, thanks. Yeah, look, thanks for the question. There's a couple of things to this. What my group are talking about is having um, impact statements for each, what I used to call the, the ward boundaries. I used to, was in the council, uh, in 1988 to 93, when we had um, wards. And I think it's important to get impact statements for those particular places for different changes to traffic flow, etc., etc. I might also add that the, the Doncaster Rail really has to be done first, probably. And also, you'd also put, um, I wouldn't leave out Springvale Road to Greensboro, because that's the last little thing of a ring that's never been done. And I think that if that was done, you know, you'll still get. The, the, the tollway, but I still think that those three things have to be done. Uh, John Elliott and I founded the Committee for Melbourne, and the first thing we did, or one of the first things we did with Joan Kerner, was to put in the South East and Freeway in the tunnel from South Melbourne to Burnley, a great success. Tunnels are needed, they have to be planned, it's important they don't come out in places such as Carlton or Kensington, and it's important that they don't have air vents which tower into the air in parkland. But tunnels are essential. I built a tunnel actually at Bamboo Creek near Marble Bar. It goes for about two k's, an underground tunnel in mining. They're essential. We need underground car parks. We need parking under buildings. And we need tunnels. It's how you do them that is important, not that we don't have them. OK, who else has got a question? Just put your hand up. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. Last night at Melbourne University, Ross Garno addressed the Grattan Institute, um, pointing out that we have 38 years to reduce emissions by 90% to stay within a safe level of temperature rise. Um, there's been no comment um, on this in any of your presentations. I live in Port Phillip where um, 
the communities engaged with the local council um, to quite a, a large yeah. extent on considering mitigation and adaption to climate change. Um, that's a comment. Um, Thank I'd you. I'd be interested in some responses. Uh, hang on, uh, Mr Doyle. Let's see if anybody else here wants to um, speak to this. Alison, perhaps you would uh, first, and then we'll go up the back. Okay, thanks. I mean, it comes as no surprise, again, speaking as a Green, that we're vitally interested in reducing carbon emissions in the City of Melbourne. And a lot of the sustainable initiatives that have come about as a, re as a result of Cathy Oakes' work on the current council, I think are to be applauded and need to be continued. The other thing is that we need to think very carefully about our balance between mitigation and ad ad adaption and get that balance right. We don't, we don't want to simply be constantly adapting to this changing environment. We want to put some things in place to slow down the pace of change. So a lot of the, the initiatives that are currently on, underway at the council need to be continued and we look, need to look at innovative new ways of reducing emissions, not only for council itself, but for residents. So for example, bringing more solar online, working out ways to make that affordable. Initiatives like the current 1200 buildings refit, which council is, is working through, extend that out to rental properties as well. So there's a lot more that we could be doing and we should be doing. Brian Shannon. Yes, I'd just like to make two quick points, firstly, I believe that uh, Melbourne City Council's policy in this area is far superior to any other councils in Victoria. This is due, and I acknowledge the work of uh, Councillor Oak in this, but I also point out that everything was done with a majority vote. So uh, I think all members, or the majority at least, of Melbourne City Council should take credit uh, for the very good initiatives that have happened. Uh, for instance, we plant 3,000 trees a year. Significant, very significant. We've got um, uh, programs uh, to reduce um, emissions from buildings, a 12,000 building program. We're far ahead of any other council in Victoria. I say that without any problem. Uh, and I think we should, A, recognise Council Oak, but we should recognise the rest of the council. So um, let's base the comments on fact. Anyone else, particularly, with Joseph? Look, you can't look at climate change uh, ir devoid of the type of economic system we have. And we do have an economic system which is based on the creation of ever-increasing profits irrespective of the human, social and environmental costs. You can make cosmetic changes, you can apply price pressures that the federal government is attempting to do. But the whole point of diverting 10% of the city's funds to uh, bankroll collectives and cooperatives was just that, to actually organise, people to be organised in the way they can be employed at the same time they're reducing greenhouse emissions. We need major economic changes as we move from a period of relative abundance to scarcity. And all the things which we've taken for granted for so long are no longer relevant. And that's why we need radical change which actually looks at the way we earn our living and the way we interact. And that's the whole purpose of the collectives and the cooperatives and using funds from the government, from the, uh, sorry, from the council to actually fund, act as seeding funding for that to decrease greenhouse emissions and decrease the impact that corporations and corporate capitalism has on our society. Next, the back. Hi, uh, Melissa Fife here from The Age. Um, my question is to Councillor Doyle. Um, probably won't surprise him that I'm asking him a question. Um, I just wanted to preface this question also by saying that um, uh, to the Lord Mayor that I'm not asking about when you're going to uh, announce your donations. I understand that will be after the election. You've made that very clear. My questions are, um, do you deny that the meetings that were reported in the Sunday Age organised by Kevin Louis, do you deny that they happened? That's the first question. And secondly, did you attend the second meeting with developers? Well, Melissa, I'm not going to respond to an Age campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a campaign that asks me to disclose because this is an Age campaign to have candidates disclose their donations before the due date. 
The age is not the Victorian Electoral Commission. They are not the Electoral Act. They are not the Local Government Act. They are not the Local Government Minister. I will disclose all of those donations, which is what the age wants me to do, in accordance with the law, as I did last time. I would simply point out, Melissa, that when you chose a person to speak on behalf of the age about what accountability should be, you chose a federal MP, Kelvin Thompson, who wrote a character reference for Tony Mockbell. Can I just say that that didn't answer the question, and I think the question was very straightforward. I'm actually an expert in asking, asking questions. That's my profession, as you know. And I think that that question needs to be answered. I think it's a straightforward question. If what we read on the front page of The Age on Sunday is correct, then I would say it's close to um, uh, people breaking the law and All right, a I'm going to stop that one there just because we can't get into a slanging match over uh, this issue and I'm sure Melissa will take what she got and um, I'd also tell you that the candidates will be around for a few minutes at the end of the session for people who want to ask further questions. Who else? Have we got, put your hand up. I'm having trouble seeing in the dark. Is there someone there? I'm going to ask one um, in the meantime, and it's been commented on by m many people, including the age, uh, about the lack of diversity um, um, among the candidates this time round, that we have, well, first of all, seven men, as has already been pointed out, but um, or eight, eight, eight men, in fact. Um, but, you know, uh, I think, Gary, you talked about youth and passion and diversity in your um, opening remarks, and I certainly don't see youth, uh, and... <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I just made the call. Uh, and, and obviously um, not a lot of diversity if we think about the diversity of this city. So I just wondered who'd like to speak to that. I, I mean, I, I totally disagree with you, Sally. Uh, my Deputy Lord Mayor candidate is 27 years of age. I mean... We're he, talking about candidates for the Lord Mayor, though. Well, that, that's well, why we're it's, here tonight. It's, it's, yep. it's, actually, it's actually about who the team is. And you have a team with both experience and youth with us. And that's really, that is really important. The other thing is, we are diverse. I mean, there, there's a very... I mean, this is a disparate group of people. I mean, there might be eight men and one woman, but I'm the only gay man here. Joe's the only anarchist. I mean, we all have different, we all have very different, different, different views. Uh, and I, I, think, I think it represents the diversity. So I've never been called part of the status quo. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm inter interested that you put me in that part. Uh, did you want to comment? Yes, look, yeah. I, uh, the age talked about seven uh, white men and um, they also incorrectly quoted me as being Indigenous. But I, I do a lot of work with Indigenous people as a pharmacist, and one tribe in New South Wales asked me to become, well, recognise my work with them. Um, I think it's important, as Gary said, to look at the team. I've got three women in my team. Connie, Connie Peglianiti, very successful person. And there's Richard. I've got um, Emily Lita Cruz, who's a Chinese lady, very, very sharp operator. And there's the readings man, Mark Rubo, and then uh, Wendy Syme and Jason. So, you know, we've got a, a fairly good, young, vibrant you know, mix of people who really are there ready to rule. Mm, uh, just one moment, Gary. Keith and then you. He's got a mic here. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Uh, I actually am thrilled that everybody looking on thinks that this is not a diverse group. How far we've come since the 60s, when, or even earlier, back in the uh, 19th century, when you virtually had to be a British Lord to get here. Uh, you have here people from completely diverse backgrounds, completely diverse uh, learning curves. And uh, you know, for, for, for Gary to sit up there, and for Joe, and indeed for Alison, and be regarded as a group of uh, middle-class white Australians, that's a remarkable achievement. It, it means that this country and this city has come of age. Anybody 
can stand. Anybody. And the problem we have is that we're the only ones that wanted to. So get it right. <laughs> Uh, Alison, did you, uh, who, Dave, yeah, Alison, yep. Okay, I just wanted to point out the fact that women comprise 51% of the population in Australia and less than 30% of representation on council. But dispensing with the data, I just wanted to point out too, and this is, this is going to just be my personal opinion, I've worked in several male-dominated professions, so it comes as no surprise to me that there aren't more women running for Lord Mayor. When I worked in accounting, what I saw very much was women in lower levels. The higher you get up the pyramid, the lonelier you get as a woman. It's exactly the same in IT when I worked there, and I worked in a railway, which maybe was an outlier, but it was also the same thing. What happens is the way that these jobs, and this is a job interview, no matter what you think, that's what we're doing. We're all doing a job interview here. And these jobs are seen as exclusively the preserve of a particular type of society, and that is wrong. And I would really encourage more people to think about that comment and think about it when you vote, and particularly when you vote on that councillor role, because the problem with lack of diversity is that you have lack of voice at the table. If you're only hearing one voice, you're going to make bad decisions. We need more diversity around the decision table. We need more people to run. Gary, you wanted to... Yes, it's illegal to, to decide whether people should or should not be standing because of sex and age. But let me make the point, my father's a councillor for 15 years and the first poll he conducted in 1941 was on equal pay for men and women. So he was concerned about it with Keith Burdock in 1941. And if we go back a little bit further in time, my great grandfather William Williams published the first book on the language of the Aborigines in 1856 and I'm happy to give anyone a copy who would like it. Or my great-grandfather published The Digger's Advocate in 1852, which is a mouthpiece of Eureka. So I think I'm standing with a tradition of looking after the interests of the people, men or women. I employ over 1,000 people, 80% of them are women. My chief executive is a woman, Michelle Levine, and I'm happily married, and I have many women friends, and I believe many of them would be good candidates. That is fan fantastic, I, Gary. Unfortunately, uh, we only have one standing. And Robert Doyle, would you like to comment on this? I'm, I'm a short, overweight, balding, <laughs> heterosexual, ageing male. And much as I would like to change that very often, there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> All right. We've probably got time for one more question. Uh, my question is for Joseph uh, Toscano. Um, the anarchist tradition has always aspired uh, to achieve democratic uh, participation, forms of democratic participation, higher than voting every few years. Uh, what could council do to uh, um, implement more uh, participation and decision-making power to the electorate? I've always been interested in the idea of direct democracy, not representation. Now, I know there were comments made about the nine people who are up for election, but the dilemma is it's basically the electorate's choice. And what we need to do is we don't need to give signed blank checks to representatives to make decisions for us for the next three to four years. We need mechanisms by which to control that. One mechanism is the power of recall to give the electorate the power, say 10 or 20% of people are unhappy with uh, an elected official, the power to recall that official by holding a, a fresh election. Another mechanism is the power of direct democracy or citizens initiated referendums, giving the people of Melbourne the opportunity to make decisions about things which, which um, concern them. For example, the tunnels. The only people who aren't asked are the people who are directly affected. And I've said over and over again, as far as the tunnels is concerned, if the people of Greater Melbourne want the people of Inner Melbourne to bear the cost of it, we need to find out in a referendum based on the state electoral roll, not the, uh, uh, what, what they want. So there are other forms of democracy. Everything has changed in the past 100 years except the way we rule ourselves and we continue to rely on representation. 
which is a very, very crude form of democracy. So direct democracy, power of recall, citizens initiated referendums, they're all concepts which can actually get people involved in the decision making process. It's only nine of us standing, there could have been a hundred of us standing. It's only a $250 deposit, you need to be on the electoral roll. Anybody could stand. <laughs> you know, but people, I fried back on the electorate. It's the electorate that's conservative. It's the electorate that wants to keep what they have and not share. And you really have to think of why is it like that? Maybe it's because of the political system we have. We rely on representation. Anybody want to respond to that particularly? Oh, just to say mm. that, uh, as I understand it, in certain parts of the United States, they have recall. And in Switzerland, you can have um, referendums on most things. And the result of that is a pretty conservative structure in Switzerland because they go to the people all the time and more often than not, they get a more conservative view than the elected representatives, mm. which is interesting. All right, look, um, we'll wrap it up and give the candidates all uh, 10 minutes to um, wander around and talk to you if you've got um, other things you'd like to discuss with them. Um, it's been a most interesting hour, I must say, not quite what I expected, but... Um, that's good. Very, very interesting. I'm very grateful to the eight of you for coming along and uh, telling us a little bit more about yourselves. And it's always a really different thing to see people in person and meet people in person rather than reading um, about them and so on. It's been fascinating. Uh, I won't name you all individually again, but I will thank you uh, collectively and very, very much for coming along tonight. Thank you. And um, if I can just uh, let the audience know, in case some of you aren't sort of regular attendees of the Fifth Estate, we will be going back to our normal kind of format in two weeks' time, which is to take an issue of the day and try and get the best possible people to come and talk about it. Well, we have done that today. It's just that we've had eight of them. Uh, and it will be George Negus and Don Watson coming in just a few days, of course, before the US election. So that's uh, 30th of October, two weeks tonight. Have a safe and lovely evening. Thank you.